Next, uh, old friend, Gilles Capel, who, as I think you all know, a very distinguished scholar of this region, of Islam, of what's going on in the banlieue of France, in the very complicated world of um, French relations with Islam. Uh, Gilles is, I'll read this, director of the Middle East Mediterranean Chair of the École Normale Supérieure, professor at Paris Sciences and Lettres, and has worked sometimes as an envoy for various presidents, including Jupiter, Monsieur Macron, Gilles. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, uh, I know that uh, had uh, the results of the soccer game uh, been different last night, I would not be here. And um, I, uh, had uh, Kyle prevailed on Killian, it would be my English opposite number who would be here in my stead. So I try to do my best. Uh, uh, the um, one thing which uh, strikes me uh, in our conference is that it took us panel number 19 or 20 to discuss with the Middle East issue. As if uh, the prevailing, uh, the, the present war between uh, Russia and Ukraine was just a reenactment of some sort of East-West war of old. It is to an extent, but it is not. And uh, as you, uh, uh, as you, uh, sorry, I pronounce it the Egyptian way. Uh, the, uh, uh, as you rightly mentioned, um, uh, the Black Sea, uh, <laughs> this, this war takes place on the Black Sea. And the Black Sea is part of the Mediterranean system. And, uh, but you know, this is not the first time uh, a war that was taking place in Europe also had a very significant extension in the East, whether it be uh, Salonique during uh, World War I, where my great-grandfather was a gendarme militaire, or uh, uh, Valentine's Day 1945, uh, which, uh, where uh, uh, FDR and Ibn Saud had their amour toujours uh, conversation, my oil against your protection, my protection against your oil. So uh, to a large extent, uh, we have to take the region into much more serious consideration than I think we, we did until, until recently. And it's not only because of oil, because of oil prices have skyrocketed, because the reason m many of us came here, we have to say that frankly to uh, Thierry, is that the climate is much better because we are freezing in Paris at zero degrees tonight. And we, this morning, we, many of us went to the beach. Uh, and uh, it's definitely, this is a very important issue, which goes back then to the St. Valentine, Valentine, Valentine's Day agreements. But um, there is also a very significant issue that we have not taken into consideration to a large extent that uh, as we, we mentioned uh, Turkey, fortunately, which I believe is an extremely important actor with what you call hyper pragmatism, which is a concept I will use and of course quote you in the future, where that means Erdogan changing sides every other day full in the t so that he will, thinks he will be re-elected. Uh, uh, but uh, this means also that uh, he uh, bought S-400s from uh, uh, Russia, sold Bayraktar drones to, to Ukraine, uh, that the Iranians are helping uh, the Russians with their own drones, and that uh, nice guy Mr. Menbedev warned the Israelis, if ever you give the Ukrainians the means to down the Iranian drones, beware uh, about uh, the Syrian skies and so on and so forth. So I think that this is not something we have really uh, thought of, uh, that the, uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, the global Middle East, uh, is also taken into uh, something which, now as you had hyper-pragmatism, which was your concept, let me try mine, which is disaffiliation, does that mean anything in English? Uh, that, uh, that means that you know Nothing has to be taken for certain. It would be hyper-pragmatism at the global scale. scale so. And uh, like, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the mission I did as special envoy to President Macron in some of the uh, southern and eastern countries of the Mediterranean. And the, what I was uh, 
what I was, was being told by my interlocutors was that uh, we do not think we're bound significantly by any former alliance. If Israel brings the, be the, brings the best missiles, China the best uh, whatever, uh, Russia this and that, we're going to choose, we're going to do a sort of cherry picking, which is okay if you think that uh, the world is uh, based on daily transactional things. But uh, this uh, may lead uh, to uh, not hyper-pragmatism, but hyper-tribalism, if I may say so. And then in, so in a region where you have to have strong security, uh, this is a major challenge that we are, we, we, we are facing uh, now, particularly in, uh, in a country like, uh, like the UAE, who's, uh, which is extremely dependent on security issues, which is part and parcel of the... Of the not the Valentine's Day Agreement, but the, uh, the Abraham uh, Accord or the, the Donald Accord, as he wanted it to be called. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly with what is happening uh, in Iran. One other thing which we have to take into, into consideration is that, you know, authoritarian uh, regimes uh, are also being shaken in the process. What is happening in Iran, uh, irrelevant, uh, regardless of what happens with GCPAA, no GCPOA, post GCPOA, and so on and so forth, is now uh, being significant, significantly different from whatever happened in the past. The Green Revolution, or whatever it was called, where you, the police and, um, arrested a number of people, sentenced them, put them in jail, and then it was put down. This is not happening. Yesterday, uh, they sentenced to death and executed uh, the first demonstrator as an uh, Adu Allah, uh, enemy of God, waging war against God, which is even worse. Uh, but this is definitely not uh, bringing any quiet. Uh, this is something much deeper that has to do with uh, issues of, um, of uh, identity, of self, of... Uh, uh, women cutting their hair in public, something which has, which has to do with, uh, with the button, uh, with, with the, what is intimate in, in Shia culture, and they're clearly at, at pains finding a way to changing. And we have to foresee uh, the fact that uh, the uh, Iranian leadership, in spite of the fact that they, they have this sort of hyper-activity uh, militarily on their borders, are in a state which is now significantly weakened, and we have to think of that for the yes. future. I mean, uh, br br uh, very okay. briefly, uh, another issue is that uh, what is happening in, in Russia also, the fact that uh, they, uh, they are unable to, to, to lead a, a military strategy which is uh, winning, except bombing civilians, uh, will also uh, change a number of things in the region. Uh, a number of countries were willing to buy Russian weaponry. Uh, what is happening now is not a great uh, showcasing for uh, Russian weaponry. So all that is, is changing. And I think that we, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a real need to, to interject much more of what happens on the southeastern fronts in this war uh, for fear not to really understand the stakes uh, which we deal with. Yeah, which is why I sort of started a bit by at least mentioning Russia's movement into the region, which, you know, isn't brand new, but is real and isn't going away. And I'm curious, you know, others may want to respond to this too, but what this does to Russia's intentions in Syria, other places. Um, but I also am, you know, very interested, you know, seeing the demonstrations in Iran. I mean, I covered the Iran revolution. I'd still try to follow it. Uh, the demonstrations in China, which are really in interesting. We don't see a lot of demonstrations in Russia, I, ha I have to say, because perhaps many of the people who would demonstrate have already left. But I do wonder what this, this shakiness in Iran and persistent rumors that Ayatollah Khamenei is quite ill, how that will impact the rest of 
the region and also what Iran sponsors, which is the thing we haven't really talked about. What do you think? Well, on uh, Khamenei's uh, health bulletin, I have no answer. No. Uh, but uh, what is interesting uh, in, in Russia also is that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the mass of uh, people who are sent to the front are increasingly yes. people from uh, the Muslim Republic or non-Russians from the Federation, not to mention uh, the uh, famous or infamous uh, Ramzan uh, Kadyrov, who Kadyrov, re yeah. repatriated recently to Chechnya uh, the, uh, the body of uh, Abdullah Anzarov, who uh, beheaded uh, uh, Samuel Paty in France and made him a hero of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Chechnya. But the, um, uh, this is going to, there is, a, there is a price that is going to have to be paid for that by, uh, by, by Putin, relying on those populations so that uh, because they are uh, you know, citizens of a different nature, and this is this is going to probably lead to a problem within the state of the union. But others here are much more uh, uh, competent than I am on this on this issue. Now, on on, on Syria, uh, I heard the Mamdour uh, say that he thought nothing would happen uh, from the Turkish side, whereas you know we had the drum beats all over the year, and uh, was it? Uh, uh, your Minister of Defense or Interior, whatever, say, it's going to start tomorrow, where we're going to wipe uh, um, the, the Turkish terrorists mm -hmm. out of everything. We're going to have our 30 kilometer deep buffer state. Mm -hmm. But uh, nothing has happened. And um, even in your hyper pragmatism concept, which I like, don't you think that at the end of the day, if you, as we say in French, you cry to the wolf and the wolf does not come, finally, you don't fear uh, the big bad wolf anymore. Well, exactly. It's that famous Kavafi poem, the barbarians are coming, but they never arrive. So what must we do now? We have, <laughs> they were a kind of answer. You have to, we have to say that it is Kavafi, the poet, and not Kazafi, as many <laughs> no, people are exactly. saying. <laughs> um,